final session of the day. Really pleased that you all are here with us for this last session. And the chair of this session will be Corey Anton, who is the vice president of the Institute of General Semantics and a professor of communication at Grand Valley State University. Corey. Thank you very much, Lance. And again, thank you all for being here. Uh, this is our session five, the Open Society and its Enemies. We do have an hour and 15 slotted for the session and in, in an attempt to try to keep a little bit of time for discussion at the end, I will be sending the speakers uh, a little note by the chat around 13 minutes to remind you that you got about two minutes left to try to keep it around 15 minutes uh, per speaker. And with that said, uh, our first speaker is Diane Sipkin from, uh, she's a professor of communication from Pace University in the United States. And the title of her paper is called uh, The Prophet Ignored Vladimir Zarev Jabotinsky. Uh, <laughs> Jabotinsky, Jabotinsky. Okay, thank you, Diane. That's all right, in the coming of the Holocaust. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, I've enjoyed, I've been here since nine and I've enjoyed everyone's presentations. Thank you again. Uh, my paper is called The Prophet Ignored, Vladimir Zev Jabotinsky and the Coming of the Holocaust. Uh, the reason I have been uh, doing, well, I, I should start by telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, my, my parents, uh, my parents are Holocaust survivors as is my brother. And um, that has really led me to uh, investigate a lot about the Holocaust, particularly uh, the interest my father had initially uh, to what the world was doing while he was just trying to survive. So I have written about the German-American Bund. By the way, I see someone else's picture up here and I'm speaking. It's kind of throwing me off. I don't know why that is. It doesn't matter. Uh, at any rate, uh, I've written about the German-American Bund. There I am. Thank you. And I've also written about Charles Lindbergh and the March of the Rabbis on Washington and LaGuardia, the mayor of New York City during World War II. And then as I was doing my research, I found someone who was very interesting. He was an outstanding speaker whose name was Vladimir Jabotinsky, a distinguished writer, orator, political leader who saw the catastrophe of the Holocaust coming and wanted to do something about it. So uh, he was very active before the Holocaust, and he's the only speaker I've ever found who in the end traveled from one little town to another in Eastern Europe and in Russia, telling Jews to get out, that something bad was coming. And in fact, my father heard him in Lithuania. So uh, it, it fascinated me. And I wanted to know more about the man, Jabotinsky. So who he was, how he came to his premonition as regards the Jews, the bold actions he took and why it didn't work. Fascinating stuff. First of all, his background, which is very important to the whole story. He was born in Odessa in 1880. And what about that? In Odessa, there was no um, pale of settlement. The Jews were not in only one part of the town. They mixed. Uh, Jews and non-Jews mixed freely. There was no Jewish quarter. So in fact, Jabotinsky grew up as a mischievous little boy who uh, wasn't afraid to fight for his rights, who uh, whenever you know, he was uh, bullied or whatever, he didn't allow it. He stood up for himself and he fought. He wasn't much of a student, but he loved to read. That was big. And I believe, and I'm sure all of you believe, that education is about reading, it really is. As far as his family life, he was not overly religious. His mother lit candles, but he always knew there would be an Israel. After all, his mother said so. In the late teens and into his 20s, he studied in Bern, Switzerland, and he writes. He was very active in the Russian community there in Bern, Switzerland, that held lots of meetings and debates. They were very, very academically oriented. And he actually gave his first, uh, his first Zionist speech predicting a Bartholomew's night for the Jews. 
The Bartholomew's Night refers to the French Huguenots who were attacked by the Catholic mobs in 1572 during the French Wars of Religion. And he said the only answer for Jews was Palestine. Where did this idea come from? It's hard to know. Uh, I have yet to find the answer. However, it may very well have come from so much of his readings. There were uh, Zionists coming up like Leo Pinsker. So, he, you know, we can only say that he was very active in reading and being a part of lectures and debates. He went to study in Rome and he studied with Antonio Labriola, where he developed the idea, he got this from him, of monism, uh, which has to do with the purity of an idea. So that when it came to Zionism, he never hyphenated it. He saw it as pure Zionism, not communist Zionism, not socialist Zionism, not worker Zionism, just pure Zionism. He also in Rome fell in love with Italian nationalism. And that also would affect his idea, his ideas of the Jews coming together as a nationalist force. Uh, while he was in Rome, he met Odessa Zionist S.D. Salzman, who gave him Zionist books to read. Uh, that included material from uh, uh, Herzl. He was at, the turning point in his life was the Kishinev pogrom in April 1903 in Bessarabia, where Jews were brutally attacked by Moldovians. The Jews had been charged with a blood libel, and Jabotinsky was sent by his newspaper. What he saw appalled him: the brutality of that was visited on these Jews, the inhumanity. And he started a Jewish defense force there. Uh, he had also already started it in Odessa, when Odessa had also been uh, under, um, it, it was thought that they would be attacked as well. In Kishinev, he met a very, very famous man and would become even more famous, the Hebrew national poet, Chaim Nachman Bialik. And Jabotinsky, little by little, became a Zionist for, voice. And he began to write, and speak, speak a lot about Zionism and the importance of the Jews moving to Palestine. He became a delegate to the uh, Sixth Zionist Congress in Basel in August 1903, and that's where he heard his idol, Herzl, and he could never forget it. He was so taken by the man that in years he would be considered a follower of Herzl because he actually did a lot and felt a lot the way Herzl did. He became a Zionist propagandist, Vladimir Jabotinsky. He traveled the Pale of Settlement in Lithuania and he spoke. Audiences loved him. He loved, they loved his voice, his eloquent gestures, his dignified manner, his zeal. He believed in what he was saying. But more than that, he began to work on developing the logic of his arguments, not just the, um, the presentation. He had presentation abilities, but he wanted to develop the logic of his views. And after a while, it, it became so that uh, he developed his arguments so that an audience, after he finished speaking, couldn't disagree with him because his logic was so tight. They came to hear him speak about Jewish nationalism, the mistaken beliefs of assimilationists and socialists, and the importance of the Hebrew language. All of these were very important to him. In World War I, he was a Russian war correspondent. He helped create the Jewish Legion to fight the Ottomans. And he was in the background for the development of the Balfour Declaration of 1917, where Britain agreed to establish a homeland for the Jews. After that came a lot of good things and a lot of bad ones. He helped create Betar. Betar was a uh, student organization with lots of uh, 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 little organizations all over Eastern Europe. Betar took in Jews who wanted to know more about their culture, who believed in pride, because unfortunately, up until now, most of the Jews living in Eastern Europe and Russia were, um, had been persecuted, and they looked it, and they acted it, and they felt it. They had their heads down. Jabotinsky never did, not in Odessa, not ever. And when he looked at these Jews who were so downtrodden, he hated it. He absolutely hated it. And he knew that the world could never respect the Jew that had his head down. And so Betar was especially known for creating the fighting Jew. 
He always felt the Jews should not only know the Hebrew language, should not only know their culture, but should know how to shoot a gun. Uh, he sees Chaim Weizmann, the head of the world, when um, Chaim Weizmann was the head of the World Zionist Organization at that time. And he felt that Chaim Weizmann was a little bit too soft when it came to working with Great Britain. He was too pliant. He gave in too much. And so uh, Jabotinsky got angry. He quit the party and he created his own party, the Union of Zionist Re Revisionists. And soon he would create a whole new organization that would uh, vie the World Zionist Organization. The worst thing that he saw happening was in 1933 when Hitler came to power. He recognized the threat that Hitler posed, not just to German Jews, but to all Jews. And he brought that to the World Zionist Congress that refused to talk about it. They were so scared. They were so scared of bringing it up. They were so frightened of, at 1933, of causing problems for the German Jews. Uh, and so in 35, he created the new Zionist organization, which was Herzlein. In other words, as I noted before, he felt that Chaim Weizmann, the head of the World Zionist Organization, was much too pliant, much too giving when it came to the British. And in the new Zionist organization, he was a political activist organization. Its goal was to build a homeland for Jews in Palestine and liquidate the diaspora. After all, he argued, every people have a country, and so should we. Even the Danish have their own little country. Everybody has their own little country, but we don't. He was disgusted with the British government's immigration policy vis-a-vis -vis Palestine. And so he introduced an emergency evacuation plan. In 10 years, he claimed that he could get millions of Jews to Palestine, and he encouraged them with this evacuation plan. Actually, the evacuation plan for Eastern Europe and Russia was first introduced in 1920 by Max Nordau, who wanted to get 600,000 Jews out of Europe. Jabotinsky's plan was to get one million and a half Jews out of Romania, Poland, Austria, the Baltic states and the Third Reich, especially Poland that had three million Jews. He also believed in creating a Palestine on both sides of the Jordan. According to him, that's what Herzl wanted, and um, the World Zionist Organization had been misled. Uh, he sees, uh, uh, and uh, he started to work meeting with leaders of Poland and Romania. He got to everybody. He got to the leaders of the Polish government. He got to the leaders of the Romanian government. He spoke to the Jews and said, listen, Poland wants their economic, he, Poland wants their Poles, their own people to develop, you know, economically. We, the Jews, are stepchildren in Poland. It's understandable. In Romania also, he said, we are stepchildren of the Romanian. And so uh, he said, the only answer is to leave for Palestine. And I'm gonna make this short, in, in the end, uh, he met with the Poles, the Romanians. They agreed to help in the evacuation of European Jews. They actually agreed to help. But unfortunately, the World Zionist Organization entered into the picture. Assimilationist Jews who insisted on staying in Poland and saw Jabotinsky as an enemy and a traitor. In fact, Stephen Wise saw him as an enemy and a traitor. But Jabotinsky knew that in Poland and Romania, the Jews would always be step stepchildren. They would never be, they would always be hated for the economic um, uh, value, the economic position that they took in these countries. Uh, he never felt, he never talked to Germany because he felt that their antisemitism was racist. The only thing that stopped Jabotinsky in the end was his death. He died in 1940. But before he died, he ran all over Europe telling Jews, you're living under a volcano. You better leave now. Sadly, they didn't listen. Thank you. But if they did, imagine, just imagine. Thank you very much for that very informative and rich account there. It's again, really, really wonderful. 
Um, and please, people, keep your questions for our uh, post presentation session when we discuss. So, our next uh, presenter is Zach Gershberg from, he's a professor of communication at Idaho State University in the USA. And he's also the author of a book that's coming out this month at University of Chicago Press, which is called The Paradox of Democracy, Free Speech, Open Media, and Perilous Persuasion. So with that, I give you the floor, Zach. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. Um, and uh, uh, I appreciate the little plug for the book. Um, I uh, wrote it with a uh, journalist who comes from the world of political theory and uh, had never heard of Marshall McLuhan or Neil Postman uh, in 2016, and be, he became obsessed with it. So that's been a five-year journey uh, that's been kind of, kind of interesting. Uh, um, but at any rate, one, one thing I wanted to, or, or I was hoping to present today uh, is kind of where I sort of, we leave that book off in our, our epilogue, something that um, you know, I've been thinking about is, you know, we try to cover uh, democracy from Athens uh, to uh, January 6th, 2021 uh, in the book. Uh, and, and so I, I, you know, I'm really excited to have this opportunity uh, today. Um, and, oh, I just, oh my goodness, lost my, uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> this will take just a second. I'm so sorry. Uh, can't believe the next time. Okay, so um, in 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 2020, uh, President Donald Trump uh, was presented with an opportunity to possess everything he had ever wanted. What I mean by that is not a second term as president, uh, so much as a command of global attention. It's hard to remember now in the before times. Now that COVID has approached a sort of endemic status and is bound by time and not space any longer. Um, but this is a man whose entire career was in life was defined by celebrity image uh, from creating his own public relations alter ego in the 1980s um, to reality to television in the early uh, 2000s uh, to being an early adopter of Twitter with a conspiracy theory over Barack Obama's birth certificate before even running for president. Um, but forget all that. Um, in early 2020, right before COVID, he actually survived an impeachment trial for bribing the Ukrainian president, uh, Zelensky. Uh, he could then operate in sheer impunity, with sheer impunity. But the big thing I wanna draw our attention to is that COVID provided Donald Trump as an individual with his focus on attention. During the lockdown, there were daily televised press conferences. Nothing else was going on. All eyes were on him. He had television. He had the first big event, the Tulsa rally, uh, as things started opening back up. He had a Bible photo op outside of the White House where they cleared protesters. Uh, the Republican National Convention was held at the White House for the first time. There was a provocative debate performance uh, and then after uh, the, the president contracted COVID, he had this triumphant return, almost looking like a dictator on the portico of the White House. All of these were very much, for any student of media would recognize them as Daniel Borstein says, a, a pseudo event. And oftentimes pseudo events through Trump's life and through almost, I'd say the last hundred years of liberal democracy have often been successful, but these failed. In fact, Trump lost by more than 7 million votes to a man, Joe Biden, who basically refused to publicly campaign. In the coup attempt on January 6, 2021, um, following a Trump speech contesting the election results, was broadcast live around the world. That too failed. Even worse, according to a White House source speaking on background to the Washington Post, watching the insurrection displeased Trump as it resembled a ragtag, low-class spectacle. To twist, uh, to twist Patrick Henry's words, if this be treason, they did not make the most of it. Recently, a congressional committee has held hearings, including a pseudo event in primetime to call attention to the crimes of January 6th 
in order to preserve and save democracy. There were witnesses and video and melodramatic intonations by the committee chairs. Jake Tapper, a news anchor for CNN, has more than once wondered aloud on the air whether this is like Watergate. And my personal favorite is when he asked guest pundit John Dean, a Nixon staffer from the Watergate hearings 50 years ago, whether we had just witnessed another John Dean moment. But television doesn't seem to matter. The hearings don't seem to matter. Trump, I think once more, will we'll get away with something. But lest I degenerate into mere punditry, speculate, speculating about politics, let me offer another interpretation of 2020 and what happened on January 6th the following year. I think it marked the end of the age of the image. Uh, the indelible moments arrested in time to influence the public and foster societal change com combined with the representations for how we come to know about the world and think about it have been superannuated. An important thesis of our book in the paradox of democracy is that the age of liberal democracy ended in 2016. Some will say it was always a sham and maybe it was, but neither the institutions nor norms of capital law and media that sustain the hegemonic basis of liberalism were from that point forward predominant. Now we find ourselves confronted with a real face of democracy as such. The struggle has commenced, but in that space, we're going back in time. I think to a place before the telegraph and the photograph. We're um, finishing a 200 year wave of human experience marked by media innovation. Um, and I expect that to slow. Images can still capture our attention, of course. And let me importantly acknowledge image-based interventions, such as a cellular video from a teenager Darnella Frazier, who earned a Pulitzer Prize for filming the extrajudicial murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. It also suggests that the photographs from the American military's chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan, images of Russia's invasion of the Ukraine have been impactful. And obviously TikTok has emerged as the fastest growing social networking site based as it is on short videos. Beside and below the acoustic message warned Eric Havlock once upon a time, there still lurks the written message. And I would say some level of imagistic residue uh, to play with Walter Ong's sort of phrase uh, will certainly continue. But what I have in mind is something more broader than the merely visual. It is clarifying and helpful that we recognize as a, you know, a really great scholar who I admire, Zizi Pop Carisi writes, Technology does not rectify the democratic condition. Media, that is to say, in our environments won't save us. Either a singular environment or different media environments, or even the ridiculous synecdoche of we hear about this as a singular function, the media. Since 2016, we are globally, from the US to England, to Ethiopia, to Myanmar, to El Salvador, to the Philippines, seeing what democracy is about and are gonna to have to negotiate what it means to experience this unruly chaotic uh, public sphere where people want power, right? Uh, and we're doing, we're having these democratic discourses play out against oligopolies of information controlled by a select few. Moving towards the suggestion that we are transitioning out of, or perhaps already indeed have absconded from that particular wave of human experience Horsting called this the graphic revolution, and we could tie it to offset lithography in 1875, or with Neil Poston, who kind of talks about how the photograph and telegraph were a one-two punch. Uh, I think we'd even maybe go to the 1830s and think about the rise of the penny press. Um, in the book, we call this uh, Morse's macrocosm uh, uh, for Samuel Morse, um, who popularized photography uh, and the daguerreotype in the United States, as well as uh, the Morse code and telegraph. Uh, he was the one who uttered the phrase, what, had, uh, uh, God, uh, uh, what hath God wrought? Um, but the other, other interesting thing about Samuel Morse is, you know, he was a nativist who wrote newspaper columns and books and ran for mayor uh, warning against popery. And yet he was uh, also a key supporter of, Pol of democratic movements in Poland at the time. Um, but the point we're trying to make, or I'm trying to make here, is that the image has always been tied to space. Uh, and even when we aren't talking about images as such, Walter Lippmann called the stereotypical images that are in our head coming from even the print press. 
Um, I see the, uh, hopefully everyone can still see me here. Um, uh, and I think there's something within all these media technologies that we've had over the years. Uh, you know, we, we kind of know Ronald Reagan from being uh, the television president, the great communicator who was a movie actor. Uh, but even before that, he was uh, a radio announcer um, uh, calling baseball games. He didn't watch these games. He got it on the ticker, the telegraph. Uh, and sort of invented how the plays looked. Um, but all of these things, I think, are changing. And I think COVID as a, as a, as a, a coronavirus is instrumental here because what's important is not what we can see, but what we cannot see, that these things operate subatomically, that they cannot be mediated, that they're spread through all around us. Um, and the fact that the end, it's now become somewhat endemic means it has been passed through time um, because we've failed to arrest it in space. And the bits and bytes of the digital world are beginning to operate in ways that we cannot see. How this plays with time and I think general semantics in general um, is, you know, I think of uh, there, uh, uh, Lance uh, uh, Strait here, who once had a talk, an essay, riffing on Korsbisky, Harold Innes, and James Carey, and he said, we are both blessed and cursed with a consciousness of time that is unique among the myriad forms of life. That's always sort of stuck with me. But um, one way to think about generational time by me is beyond only sustaining knowledge, but thinking of it rhetorically, what that means for knowledge to be passed down or strategies or movements or hopes or desires to be passed down. And if we accept that humans are time bound and we privilege the means of communication, as Korsbisky writes in What I Believe, and this also then leads to a focus on responsibility and ethics, but that's hard to do. And the battles threatening democracy, hot wars and as in Ukraine, reactionary thinking and policies in the US are all geared towards time. Memory laws and the teaching of history um, and, and, and policies in the United States are all geared towards time. Um, you know, uh, and I don't know if you think about climate change, I think it's absolutely bound up with time. If it's something that that is the variable, uh, that that's going to have to be, uh, figured out first is that long-term future who can plan, adopt and execute long-term strategies. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about restoring some sense of normalcy to public health, science, politics, the economy, but that would take decades. And it's unlikely to look like it ever did look. So I don't know exactly what the future holds and our problems may no longer even be recognizing the important differences between the map and the territory. You know, if you think about digital blockchain technology and things like NFTs, it doesn't even provide exclusive ownership of an image. When you buy an NFT, you buy the fact that you have bought a piece of digital artwork. So what does this mean for citizen organisms in an environment defined as Kate Eichhorn has argued in a new book, Content? Media ecology importantly cautioned us against focusing too much on content, privileging the study of environments. But what happens when McLuhan's aphorism is inverted, especially with AI interventions becoming more pronounced? Public worries are being expressed about a singularity where uh, digitized intelligence uh, obtains self-awareness but it's far more likely that IL will become rhetorically deceptive first. They're truly gonna learn computer minds might process data in human history and conclude rhetoric and time are the most vital variables. They may even be plotting that right now. The death of the image, however, is that the problems we face as citizens in a democratic environment will be more acutely felt than negotiating the representation of reality, which has been our main task for the last 200 years. We will never quite have the democracy we want, because we're ultimately condemned to human communication. Um, there's always other, going to be other people, low information voters, corporations, fascists, leaders we support who nevertheless continually let us down. But we have to try to inform and persuade and organize and decide. And that function of democracy has not changed. Um, however, so much of liberal democracy and the rhetorical invention has been about short-term campaigns for controlling space. And now the task will be looking for patterns of organization that are explicitly time bound, echoing, I think, Harold Ennis's plea for time. And that struggle for meaning central to every democracy 
continual frustrations, the bad faith that will continue. There's no getting around this. But there is some hope here that the variable of time might more easily be considered now that the age of the image has uh, finished. Thank you. I appreciate it. And sorry, my light turned off here. My automatic light turned off. But thank you. Thank you very much, Zach. Again, that was a very provocative, very politically relevant talk. So I'm sure people have lots of questions for you as we uh, finish up here. Our next speaker uh, is Carol Matthews, who is a writer and former dean from Vancouver Island University up in Canada. She's had a third edition of her book, Ariadne Then and Now, The Labyrinth and the End of Times. It's being published by Neo Poesis Press that soon. And I, I had a chance to look at that book. It is a profound set of meditations on life and death and paths both taken and not taken. Cannot recommend that enough uh, for people. You know, please, please check that out. Uh, the title of her talk today is called Coincidence, Orwell, The Labyrinth and the End of Times. Carol? Thank you very much, Corey, for that very kind introduction and, um, and for the mention of the book. I really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm, very pleased to be speaking to you today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. And I'm always grateful for the opportunity to be able to live and work and, and learn on this land. And I'm also really uh, honored to be able to be speaking in this symposium, a field in which um, it's very foreign territory, territory to me, I know nothing about it. Um, but it's very interesting, and I've had a really interesting day tomorrow. I want to thank today, I'll thank all the speakers who spoke earlier. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you a bit about coincidence, about labyrinths, and um, about the end of times, which seem to be looming closer and closer, I think. My friend, the late and wonderful Canadian poet P.K. Page, used to talk a lot about coincidence, and she said, I believe in coincidence. Sometimes I think it's the only thing I believe in. And I, I too believe in coincidence, so how can I not? It is a coincidence that I'm speaking to you today across several time zones and thousands and thousands of miles. And it's a very, um, very much a labyrinthian um, journey of coincidence that led me here because um, <clears throat> a year ago, I was talking to my friend Marshall Souls about his book, The Pulse in the Global Me Membrane. And I was complaining about problems I had with the publisher and he told me about his publisher Dale Winslow and how great she was and then introduced us by email and coincidentally Dale was interested in labyrinths and so I sent her my manuscript and she liked the book and agreed to publish it but this being the time of COVID she said why didn't I add a new section about COVID restrictions and how they'd affected labyrinth walkers and that took me on some new explorations then Dale asked Lance Strait to write an introduction to my newly revised book, and he wrote a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Lance, and thank you, Dale. And then he invited me to be here today. So here I am, absolutely coincidentally. And whenever I give a talk, I try to find a connection to an event to that date that might be significant. So I was pleased to discover that coincidentally, it's George Orwell's birthday today. And I had just been reading Rebecca Solnit's book, Orwell's Roses. And again, coincidentally, I'd chosen Solnit's words as an epigraph to my book about labyrinths. Solnit wrote, a labyrinth is a symbolic journey, but it is a map which we can really walk on, blurring the difference between map and world. And maybe between world and word, I thought, something that I find in Orwell, who gave us many new words for our world, like crime think, double think, that speak, new speak, and his writing gave us the term Orwellian times, a description that we quite often use to actually describe our current world. His politics and the English language in which he advises using plain English and avoiding euphemism still influences how many of us try to choose our words. Orwell wrote about the need for truth and worries that this, the very concept of objective truth is fading out of the world and that lies will pass into history. 
Yet at times, sincerity and humanity are more important to him than mere facts. For a creative writer, he says, possession of the truth is less important than emotional sincerity. Perhaps all that a person can do in Orwellian times is to try to remain human. In Down and Out in Paris and London, Orwell refers to E.M. Forster's comments about T.S. Eliot's proof rock during the year 1917. Some people felt that proof rock, that Eliot's poem was inappropriate during a time of war. But Forster felt otherwise, and so does Orwell. Orwell says if he'd been a soldier fighting in the Great War, he would rather have got hold of proof rock than Horatio Bottomley's letters to the boys in trenches. He says he'd felt that simply by standing aloof and keeping in touch with pre-war emotions, Eliot was carrying on the human heritage, so different from the bayonet girl and what a relief. Sometimes we need to stand aloof. The winding path of the labyrinth allows me to stay aloof from some of the horrors that otherwise preoccupy me. War, racism, hunger, homelessness, mass shootings, etc. While forming a question about things I need to do right now and close to home. The guidance that's sometimes given for, the, for walking a labyrinth is to use three R's. You have a, an open-ended question when you enter, but then you release as you enter, you receive at the center and you return. And sometimes you return with new knowledge. These days in climate crisis, I sometimes return with more R's than that, like reuse, repurpose, recycle, resist, resist and refuse and just say no. Over the last quarter of the century, quarter century, the labyrinth has given me a map and a metaphor that interests me both symbolically and practically, and, and it provides me with a space in which I can focus on my own humanity. First attracted by the lovely labyrinth at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, I then read Walking a Sacred Path by Reverend Lauren Artress. She's the Grace Cathedral spiritual director, director, canon emeritus, and founder of Veritatis, which is a nonprofit labyrinth training and resource center. And it was her writing which taught me about the three R's. Although sometimes the words are used interchangeably, labyrinths differ from mazes. A maze's intent is to confound you, whereas a labyrinth is a universal path on which you can't get lost. The way in is the way out. The winding path takes you forwards, then backwards, so it's not always easy to see where you're going. But if you stay on the path, it always leads you to the center and back out to the place where you first started. In an age, you can get lost. Lance Strait wrote in his poem, A Turn of a Phrase, a turn of a phrase is an endless maze. Just around the bend is another dead end. And I reply, the turn of a phrase ain't an endless maze for a polymath on a labyrinth path. It's a Mobius strip and a meaningful trip, which is made out of bends that have no dead ends. Mazes and labyrinths clearly offer very different experiences. Where a maze represents complexity, a labyrinth represents simplicity. In a maze, you require a strategy. A labyrinth is about trust. A maze is about deduction. A labyrinth is about intuition. A maze provides diversion, but a labyrinth inspires reflection. While no kind of expert about them, I walk and learn from labyrinths. I believe they teach me something about sincerity and about intention. When I was dealing with cancer, the labyrinth was a way of preparing for whatever might lie ahead, the surgery and whatever after. It helped. So I continued to walk labyrinths to reflect on what it meant to be growing older, living in an ominous time and approaching death. 
I decided that Ariadne, the goddess of the labyrinth, was a good person with whom to consult. So while walking various labyrinths, I recorded imaginary conversations with her in my book. Because the labyrinth pattern has fascinated people for thousands of years all around the world. There's labyrinths in Greece, Rome, Scandinavia, or patterns of labyrinths in France, Italy, Peru, South America, the USA, all over the place. Ancient labyrinths and new ones. Where I live, there may be as possibly as many as 80 labyrinths close by in private gardens, churches, beaches, parks, wherever people are searching for spirals, I guess. Um, some researchers have discovered prehistoric cave paintings that depict spirals and horned animals, hinting at the mythic story of the famous labyrinth built at Knossos in Crete, a labyrinth which has generated so many stories. A very quick version of the Cretan myth of the labyrinth goes like this. Minos, the king of Crete, angered Poseidon, who then cursed Minos's wife, causing her to lust after a bull. The famous inventor Daedalus helped Pasiphae satisfy her desire by creating a hollow wooden crown that allowed her to receive the attentions of the bull. A uh, cow suit, my husband used to call it. Anyway, from that mating, Pasiphae conceived the Minotaur, a hybrid creature, half human, half bull. And horrified by the beast, Minos then instructed the clever Daedalus to create a labyrinth to contain it. And he gave his daughter Ariadne, the Minotaur's half-sister, the task of guarding the labyrinth. Given to arguments, King Minos soon clashed with King Aegeus of Athens, and Minos ordered the Athenians to send seven maidens and seven youths to walk the labyrinth every three years. They were regularly devoured by the Minotaur until the great Greek hero, Theseus, came and arrived to rescue them. He was only able to do that because Ariadne, who had just fallen in love with him, gave him a golden thread, which allowed him to find his way in and out and lead the young people to safety. He then ran off with Ariadne to the island of Naxos. There are many puzzling aspects to this story. Why did the young people keep coming to get slaughtered year after year? Why, since the labyrinth is a one-way path, couldn't they easily escape? Why, how for that matter, could such a labyrinth actually contain a minotaur? As with all the Greek myths, there are interesting contradictions and really striking coincidences. They're, they're lively stories. When Dale proposed that I write about lockdown labyrinths, COVID restrictions were closing many facilities and gatherings. And so first I wrote about alternatives to finger lab, alternatives like finger labyrinths and online labyrinths and then began to think about the relationship between technology and labyrinths. And Googling those two words produced about 39 million results in 40 seconds. But most of these findings were used to refer to mazes and uh, mazes that were hard to navigate, of course. Technology offers new ways of thinking about the metaphor of the labyrinth. At one level, it's like um, the information highway where you pursue uh, circuitous path and eventually you get there. Yet at times the internet branches out into rhizome-like patterns leading to thousands of arbitrary and seemingly unrelated links. But the World Wide Web seems to me like the underground connections of the mycelium network, which spreads everywhere underground and connects everything. Not surprisingly, some environmentalists call mycelium the wood wide web. The idea of labyrinthian mycelium made me wish to reach out across time and space into imaginary conversations with my late husband. He had been my labyrinth companion in the past. And so now I began to talk to him and, and envision a new kind of meditative walk winding across time and between and through dimensions, which is another exploration into coincidence. While walking the labyrinth, my mind sometimes turns as a kind of meditation or mantra to a poem by one of my favorite American poets, the late Theodore Retke. I'll quote just a few verses from that wonderful poem, The Waking. I wake to sleep 
and take my waking slow. I feel my fate in what I cannot fear and learn by going where I have to go. Light takes the tree, but who can tell us how? The lowly worm climbs up the winding stair. I wake to sleep and take my waking slow. Great nature has another thing to do to you and me. So take the lively air and lovely, learn by going where to go. This shaking keeps me steady. I should know what falls away is always and is near. For me, Retke's poem reflects the path and pace of the labyrinth. Like the lowly worm, we trust the winding pathway that brings us into the unknown, a path that takes us into all that great nature has to reveal. So where does that leave us? Whether on the ground or in cyberspace or in a labyrinth, a labyrinth can act as a temporal container, a place where all our experience, past, present, and future, what has been and what might have been, what could be and what should be, all come together. A path on which we simply go where we have to go, all of it happening at once within this ancient container from the beginning right through to the end of times. So much cope. Just astonishing coincidence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carol. Again, that was just, again, very beautiful, thoughtful set of reflections. I really appreciate it. So this leaves us to the final speaker of our session, a man who needs no introduction, Professor Lance Strait, who is at, uh, Professor of Communication and Media Studies at Fordham University, that's in the USA. He's a founding member of the Media Ecology Association and the current president of the Institute of General Semantics. Lance, the floor is yours. Thank you, Corey. Well, the story is a familiar one. Alfred Korzybski was a Polish nobleman. He studied engineering. He was wounded while serving in the Russian army during the First World War. And then after taking up residence in the US, he became the founder of the Discipline of General Semantics and the Institute of General Semantics. And this was motivated in large part by his experiences during the war. But he was far from alone in coming to the realization that armed conflict was a form of madness and concluding that something must be done to ensure that all of that death and destruction that the world had just witnessed must never happen again. And out of that effort came significant contributions to our understanding of the human condition and how we might go about making things better individually and collectively. But there's more to the story when we look at it. For example, one of the many effects of the First World War was the Russian Revolution and the establishment of the first communist state, the Russian Soviet Republic or Socialist Federative so Soviet Republic, which became the core of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics or Soviet Union. Now this in particular posed a challenge to the existing capitalist economic system, the existing order, political order in the Western world, as well as its political systems. Insofar as communism represented a viable alternative to existing political economies, and it was one that, com that was committed to revolution and the overthrow of the capitalist system, one that challenged the authority and legitimacy of governments based on liberal democracy, and free enterprise, well, it represented an unprecedented challenge to the status quo, and it was perceived by as an, ex as an existential threat by the ruling classes, power elite, affluent inv individuals, and much of business and industry. The concern was not that the Bolsheviks had established a form of authoritarian rule and exhibited oligarchic tendencies. And actually this wasn't readily apparent at first. It only became increasingly more obvious over the ensuing decades. But in and of itself, autocratic rule under the guise of communism or socialism was not particularly different from many other existing systems of government, but it was the anti-capitalist ideology and the glorification of the working class and this commitment to global revolution and a new international order that represented a true crisis for the West. And this context is needed to fully understand that otherwise familiar story of Korzybski's response 
to the horrors of war, which began with the writing of his first book, Manhood of Humanity, published in 1921, which was originally subtitled The Science and Art of Human Engineering. Now, this early work was eclipsed by his magnum opus, Science and Sanity, published in 1933, but it was in this first book that Korzybski defined humanity as the time-binding class of life. What he meant was that we possess the capacity to store knowledge, to pass it on from one generation to the next, and through that to make progress over time. And what is especially interesting is the unique perspective this provides to human activity in the present, as it allowed Korzybski to address the conflicts and crises of his time, for example, in his less than sympathetic comments on the capitalist era. And, he's, and he states, uh, this is a quote, it may seem strange, but it is true that the time binding exponential powers called humans do not die. Their bodies die, but their achievements live forever. All of our precious possessions, science acquired by experience, accumulated wealth in all fields of life, our kinetic and potential use values created and left by bygone generations. They are humanity's treasures produced mainly in the past and conserved for our use by that peculiar function or power of man for the building of time. So Korzybski here builds his case for time binding, for time binding based wealth as a common human inheritance. Every innovation, every product, every action that human beings undertake is made possible by generations of intellectual and physical labor. It follows that there's also an ethical component to Korzybski's argument as he explains, again, I quote, this fact of supreme ethical importance applies to all of us. None of us may speak or act as if the material or spiritual wealth we have were produced by us. For if we be not stupid, we must see that what we call our wealth, our civilization, everything we use or enjoy is in the main the product of the labor of men now dead, some of them slaves, some of them quote unquote owners of slaves. And here arises a most important question, since the wealth of the world is in the main the free gift of the past, the fruit of the labor of the dead, to whom does it of right belong? The question cannot be evaded. Is the existing monopoly of the great inherited treasures produced by dead men's toil a normal and natural evolution? Or is it an artificial status imposed by the few upon the many? Such is the crux of the modern controversy. Korzybski's implication is that any attempt to deny individuals access to our common human inheritance is decidedly unethical. His concern with justice here is second only to his concern with peace. And he imagined a new kind of society that would value knowledge over property. It would value progress overall, but progress generalized from scientific investigation to all aspects of human life progress in conflict re 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 resolution and diplomacy, progress in equality of opportunity and outcome, progress in human rights, progress in justice. True progress would include progress in politics, economics, society and culture, not to mention medicine and mental health, in addition to the already well-established progress taking place in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Although not identified as such, manhood of humanity is an exercise in utopian idealism, which he framed in terms of human engineering inextricably linked to science. I quote again, humanity in order to live must produce creatively and therefore must be guided by applied science, by technology. And this means that the so-called social sciences of ethics jurisprudence, psychology, economics, sociology, politics, and government must be emancipated from medieval metaphysics. They must be made scientific. They must be technologized. They must be made to progress and to function in the proper dimension. They must be made time-binding sciences. 
So who then is best situated to oversee the technology, the technologization of society? Well, Korzybski's answer, not surprisingly, was people like himself. So he wrote, if we, were, if we are ill, we consult a physician or surgeon, not a charlatan. We must learn that when there is trouble with the producing power of the world, we have to consult an engineer, an expert on power. Korzybski's utopia then is a society administered by engineers and scientists, including individuals able to apply scientific and technical principles and procedures to politics, economics, and other aspects of society. And this leads him to emphasize and quote again, the imperative necessity of establishing a national time-binding agency, a dynamic department, that's in caps, dynamic department, for stimulating, guiding, and guarding the civilizing energies, the wealth-producing energies, the time-binding energies, in virtue of which human beings are human. For then and only then, human welfare unretarded by monstrous misconceptions of human nature, by vicious ethics, vicious economics, and vicious politics will advance peacefully, continuously, and rapidly under the leadership of human engineering, happily and without fear, in, according with, in accord with the exponential law, the natural law of the time-binding binding energies of man. So again, utopian, but to help us understand what Korzybski was talking about, a useful parallel can be found in the work of the celebrated economist Thorsten Veblen, and specifically from a book he published the same year as Manhood of Humanity, which is titled The Engineers and the Price System. In this work, Veblen identifies how traditional economics overlooks the changes brought on by the industrial system. I'm going to read from his book now. Veblen writes, it has been usual, and indeed it is still not unusual to speak of three coordinate factors of production, land, labor, and capital. The reason for this threefold scheme of factors in production is that there have been three recognized classes of income, rent, wages, and profits. And it's been assumed that whatever yields an income is a productive factor. This scheme has come down from the 18th century. It's presumed to have been true in a general way under the conditions which prevailed in the 18th century. And it's therefore also been assumed that it should continue to be natural or normal, true in some eminent sense under any other conditions that have come on since then. Seen in the light of later events, this threefold plan of coordinate factors and production is notable for what it omits. It assigns no productive effect to the industrial arts for the conclusive reason that the state of the industrial arts yields no stated or rateable income to any one class of persons. It affords no legal claim to a share in the community's yearly production of goods. The state of the industrial art is a joint stock of knowledge derived from past experience and is held and passed on as an indivisible possession of the community at large. It is the indispensable foundation of all productive industry, of course, but except for my certain minute fragments covered by patent rights or trade secrets, this joint stock is no man's individual property. For this reason, it has not been counted in as a factor in production. The unexampled advance of technology during the past 150 years has now begun to call attention to its omission from the threefold plan of productive factors handed down from that earlier time. So in this passage, Veblen includes a concept similar to time binding. His emphasis on the industrial arts suggests that the Marxist focus, the communist focus on capitalists and workers misses an important change brought on by technological evolution. As he goes on to explain, I quote again, in more than one respect, the industrial system of today is notably different from anything that has gone before. It is eminently a system, self-balanced and comprehensive. It's a system of interlocking mechanical processes 
rather than of skillful manipulation. It is mechanical rather than manual. It is an organization of mechanical powers and material resources. It is of an impersonal nature after the fashion of the material sciences on which it constantly draws. For all these reasons, it lends itself to systematic control under the direction of industrial experts, skilled technologists who may be called production engineers for want of a better term. So for Veblen, also, it's the engineers who are essential to industrial production and the only ones prioritizing production. The owners and the managers, on the other hand, are all too willing to sacrifice productivity for the sake of profit and are supported by government in doing so. The result then is an inevitable conflict between the engineers and those whose main concern is finance. And so he writes, many of the younger generation are beginning to understand that engineering begins and ends in the domain of tangible performance and that commercial expediency is another matter. Indeed, they're beginning to understand that commercial expediency has nothing better to contribute to the engineer's work than so much lag, leak, and friction. The four years experience of the war has also been highly instructive on that head. So they're beginning to draw together on a common ground of understanding as men who are concerned with the ways and means of tangible performance in the way of productive industry, according to the state of the industrial arts as they know them at their best. And there is a growing conviction among them that they together constitute the su sufficient and indispensable general staff of the mechanical industries on whose unhindered teamwork depends the due working of the industrial system and therefore also the material welfare of the civilized peoples. So also to these men who are trained in the stubborn logic of technology, nothing is quite real that cannot be stated in terms of tangible performance. And they are accordingly coming to understand that the whole fabric of credit and corporation finance is a tissue of make-believe. And then Veblen's conclusion is that any possibility of revolution will depend on the engineers, not the workers. And as he writes, those gifted, trained, and experienced technicians who are now in possession of the requisite technological information and expertise are the first and instantly indispensable factor in the everyday work of carrying on the country's productive industry. They now constitute the general staff of the industrial system. In fact, whatever, whatever law and custom may formally say in protest, the so-called captains of industry may still vaingloriously claim that distinction and law and custom still countenance their claim, but the captains have no technological value at all. Therefore, any question of a revolutionary, revolutionary overturn in America or in any other of the advanced industrial countries resolves itself in practical fact into a question of what the guild of technicians will do. In effect, it is a question whether the discretion and responsibility in the management of the country's industry shall pass from the financiers who speak for the vested interests to the technicians who speak for the industrial system as a growing, a going concern. So long as the vested rights of absentee ownership remain intact, the financial powers, the vested interests, will continue to, to dispose of the country's industrial forces for their own profit. And so soon or so far as these vested rights give way, the control of people's material welfare will pass into the hands of the technicians. There is no third party. The chances of anything like a Soviet in America, therefore, are the chances of a Soviet of technicians and to the due comfort of the guardians of the vested interests and the good citizens who make up their background, it can be shown that anything like a Soviet of technicians is at the most a remote contingency in America. So now as jarring as it may seem, be to see Veblen use the term Soviet in an American context, 
It's important to recall that it was a brand new term in 1921, one absent much of the negative connotations that would later accrue to it. And it was a word that, and it's a word that refers to a style of administration via a local con council. That's what Soviet means. And throughout this work, Veblen takes great care to stay how unlike to state how unlikely the prospect of revolution is in the United States and how his goal was objective analysis, not advocacy. Still, it's not too difficult to discern his underlying views and Veblen's own utopian impulse. And the parallels between Korzybski and Veblen help us to clarify how both were working within the zeitgeist of the post-World War I era. But to return to Korzybski, the utopian hopes that mo motivated him in writing Manhood of Humanity lacked any realistic hope or plan for implementation, and no doubt subsequent events further dissuaded him from following the path of the social activist, but he continued to build upon the basic notion of time binding as he shifted his emphasis from the societal to the individual, as he came to the conclusion that the necessary precondition for large scale social, political, and economic change was small scale psychological and educational change. This also led him to realize that time binding is a function of our ability to engage in symbolic communication, chiefly by way of language. But what remains consistent is Korzybski's belief in progress, enabled by time binding, amplified by the scientific method and potentially generalizable to every area of human activity. Belief in progress is in and of itself a progressive belief, a belief that things can change, that we are not prisoners of biology and so-called human nature, that we can make things better. This is the basis of Korzybski's progressive vision, a utopian view of individual and so social maturation of a world characterized by peace and justice, by the openness of science and democracy, by meritocracy and by sanity. The work that Korzybski began with manhood of humanity that further took shape with science and sanity that he continued to develop through the Institute of General Semantics in his lifetime remains unfinished. This is in keeping with the understanding of science and the value he placed on progress that motivated him in the first place. Our knowledge continues to grow. As long as we continue the effort to increase our understanding of our world and of ourselves, the progressive vision that Korzybski shared with so many others is not one of utopian perfection, but of continued evolution and improvement of the human condition as we pursue the goals of peaceful coexistence, justice for all, and a sustainable future. We all have a part to play in furthering these goals and carrying this vision forward into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lance, for that. Wow, there's so much to be said about that. Wow, wait. So we got a little bit of time here. I would love for people to please don't be shy. Uh, so we want to offer a question, observation for our panelists. Lance, I have a question. I guess people are, are thinking. I, I, my question to you would be, what would you say to someone who's wearing the Neil Postman thermostatic view and wants to say, yeah, progress, schmagress. You know, there's a certain point where the technicians have taken it over and it gets too far. And what, what do we do with, you know, changing what Korzybski in 1940 or 50 would have said versus what he would say in 2022? Would you, would you, would you want to weigh on the thermostatic uh, view as a, as a possible challenge to some of progress unrelentingly going on. I, I think you're right, Corey, and, and Neil would certainly um, be critical of making that an absolute value. But throughout his career, uh, you know, I mean, of course, Neil Postman was also um, influenced by Korzybski. He worked with S.I. Hayakawa. And throughout his career, he also advocated for the same kind of uh, applied science approach to language uh, and to uh, our thinking that uh, comes out of general semantics. I and mean, he remained a general semanticist throughout 
all of that. Uh, so and he, I think, you know, his argument would be that technology itself will not solve our problems. And, and that's actually consistent with Korzybski. You know, he wasn't saying that technology sol will solve our problems, but that we need to apply that technological approach. Um, and I think it's also different from the kind of approach that Alul was criticizing, but that we need to apply it in everyday life to be rational. And that's building a bridge to the 18th century, right? What was the 18th century? It was the time of the you know, rational rationalist, the enlightenment. I, mean, I think that that is the project that everyone is trying to, um, trying to kind of salvage against the, the over the imbalance um, of technology that, that's really driven us into an irrational uh, way of, of, of life and, and, and of thinking. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Robin, you had a question, Ups, observation? Yes. Uh, thank you for this discussion. Robin. Why do I, why do I, not Robin. Robin has her hand up. Robin. Oh, Robin. Okay. I'm sorry. Robin. Robin, are you there? You're, you need to be mute. I don't think you have a mic. I don't see a mic there. Well, Robert, while Robin's getting her mic set up, we can have you. Observation question. Yes, question. What do other people think of general semantic as a multidiscipline uh, orientation of helping people, since we have such polarized societies, departments and companies and societies, being able to talk more con constructively to each other, or at least provide some type of open-minded thinking, if that's possible, and the importance of what... Uh, additional partnerships with that orientation uh, partnering with not only presidents of universities on the philosophy orientation and communication of general semantics but the need for the uh, departments in, in colleges to work together more cons effectively as well as corporations and societies and ask, also working with Aspen Institute and it's New York City has a uh, business and society uh, orientation in New York City, uh, which they've come up with a business roundtable of Fortune 500, which ties into this type of thinking, where it's not just um, a profit only, which is a conservative orientation, um, leaving everything to uh, inheritance uh, and what's sin, frankly, <coughs> according to conservatives, war on taxes, war on liberals, war on everyone. But they've expanded it to stakeholder capitalism for the, their stakes of not only short-term, but long-term sustainable profits, but also for the employer ease, the communities, and even social justice issues of which socioeconomic justice and resentment are- Robert, do you have a question? Do you have a nature. question? Yes, what do you think of the multidiscipline orientations and ability of general semantics to work, the importance of those things and importance of partnership with other groups to grow okay, more. Okay, I'll answer, quickly. I think highly of it. Very, very good. Rob, Robin, can you get your question in here? Can you get your mic on? I mean, her question was basically, is it technological evolution an oxymoron? Is it more de-evolution? Look at the social media issues and computer problems. I think computer problems is kind of funny there. Uh, so, do any of the panelists want to speak on that, or do we want to follow up on that? I'll, just, I'll say the answer is no, it's not an oxymoron. Okay. That's very good. How about uh, other questions for, for our other panelists here? Observations. Jonathan? Apropos of uh, Lance's uh, I think that the invocation of uh, George Orwell is, is welcome. Um, he, he was really good at keeping things brief. And I'm wondering uh, if, well, when you talk about labyrinths, it makes me think of Borges, who um, talked about infinite libraries, but only wrote short stories. Um, does he enter into your studies, Carol? Yeah, I... I... 
I've read a bit of Borges on labyrinths. I think sometimes he's talking about them as mazes, though, isn't he? It seems to me that he he presents them that way. He likes the pattern of it, but the, and it's a distinction that's been made. I guess fairly recently, and a lot of people do still use the terms interchangeably. But if you were to make a distinction, labyrinth, if you looked at the Cretan labyrinth, that is, uh, and the Cretan labyrinth, and then the Chart labyrinth, the labyrinths that were around in the 13th century, they were always that one way path. So um, I think Borges is wonderful, whatever he does, but um, I don't connect it so much with labyrinths. There's a lot of stuff in literature about labyrinths. And uh, and they can lead you all over the place, but I find it just endlessly interesting myself. Thank you, Terry. You had a, a question. Uh, I'm going to make some very quick comments because my technology is dying. I think there's something wrong with it. Um, first, to Diane, I think Jabotinsky is very fascinating, and I thought of. Um, Neil Postman, he was smart, His, he, and, and you made the comment he wasn't considered a good student, and I thought, well, the teachers were stupid, he was smart, and I, and I read something this week, and I don't remember where, that Postman was mocking the stupid teachers around. Um, and then my other comment to Carol Matthews, I've had a lot of experience with labyrinths, and I used it as, um, uh, Delbert Ames, the father of perception, advised people to go to sleep and ask you a question. And I found the labyrinth absolutely fascinating. And I had a similar experience when I would walk my dogs in the park. I was distracted and playing ball and meeting people or whatever. And then when I would start walking again, I would have an insight about my work, my writing. So I think it really works. And that's my experience. Um, I am um, not um, to Zach. Um, I, I had to laugh at myself. I said, well, I'm really an optimist. So I sort of don't think we're in as much trouble as, you know, the, the lack of image or the change from image would uh, indicate. Um, and then uh, to Lance, fascinating. And I remember reading the theory of the uh, leisure class and sociology and some other things, and the sociologists claim him. But what I was thinking about was Andrew Young, who ran for president and then mayor and talked about a guaranteed income, which I agree with. And so I think maybe we are, I'm being optimistic and I attribute it to my personality. And also I say I'm Postman's student. He was optimistic. I think we can have change and I think we're getting there. I think people are getting mad as hell and don't want to take it anymore. End of my story. Thank you, Terry. I mean, I think one follow up real quickly on Terry's observation, and this is to echo maybe Robin's, is that, and this is a response to I don't know if Lawrence wants to weigh in on this, but I think one person's progress is another person's de evolution. One person's progress is another person's de evolution. Do you, do you see what I'm saying, Lance, or, you know, Terry, right? That, I mean, what, what one group, an entire group could see progress, for example, I mean, the, the Roe v. Wade stuff, I mean, some people see this as long-awaited progress, other uh -huh. people see it as devolution. Right. Sure, sure. I see but, going but you know, that, that's like react, you know, it's, it, it is going backwards, in the sense that it's returning to a previous state. It depends upon what group you're in. No, but I, I mean, just technically, progress is going forward into yeah. something new I rather know. than returning to a previous situation. Right winger, we had been backsliding in a bad way, and finally, some progress is being made. See what I'm saying? Like to the person yeah. who's a hard right winger, they see this as progress because what we what they're calling what we would have called progress, they're going to call that the devolution that finally we're overcoming. I'd like to know what Zach thinks about this since he's written a book on on democracy. I, 
it's you know I, I I think what we we wrote about is just the law often functions as a constraint on democracy, and uh, we were sort of led to understand through the mid to late twentieth century how the law would protect rights, and in fact, what happened yesterday was one of the first times um, the Supreme Court actually revoked a constitutional right that it um, had previously granted. And I think that just speaks to this sort of this age period that the law, the media environment or the mainstream press, um, our institutions can hold and make steady progress. Uh, I just don't think we can take that for granted anymore moving forward. And whatever opportunities um, some groups see to combat this, it, it's going to take a great deal of time. And that's why I, I just kind of think the time binding is, is significant. Thank you. G Gary, did you have something you wanted to say? I always have something to say. Um, forgive me uh, for uh, wearing the glasses, but uh, it's not because I'm a movie star. Um, but I've just been operated on both eyes and you don't want to see it. It's a mess. Um, but I've, I found this last session particularly interesting and, and particularly uh, Diane's uh, paper in which she dealt with Japotinsky. Uh, and it, it reminds me of work um, as my work has gone from being a television director uh, to essentially being involved now with architecture and design. Um, that Odessa uh, was particularly interesting in terms of its cafes, which were segregated, but became the hotbed of Zionism. Uh, and I've been trying to trace cafes around the world in terms of their influence. Uh, it, 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 gets me to an area, perhaps a, a question of, of my, uh, my colleagues, and that is, does Kurt Zivsky or do you see further work being done in terms of the semantic analysis of, of place? Um, uh, because I, I, I find architecture and buildings uh, speaking to us in unique ways. And I, I would love to hear your opinions in that regard. I think that's so, wide open. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, before you answer, uh, since you're doing research on cafes, I review books for a Holocaust newspaper. And I reviewed a book. The name doesn't come to me, but it just came out about uh, Portugal and the Jews that waited there to come to America or anywhere for that matter. They created a cafe society, a big cafe society, where even women, you know, at first only men were allowed to come to these cafes. This was during the war, but, but women came too. So I, I did want to point it out to you, if you'd like to look into that. I, uh, I, it's the Jews in Portugal, refugees waiting for uh, it, it, a book that just came out. I, I would be most interested in, in learning about it. I'm at the present time uh, writing uh, an autobiography of myself, as they usually are, um, because as a Holocaust victim, um, what, you, what you spoke of was of particular interest to me. Uh, I, I didn't have the opportunity, and I did want to point this out. As I was doing my research on Jabotinsky, since he dealt with a lot of Polish non-Jews up there in the government, um, the Poles helped, they were willing to help Jews leave. And they even helped Jews leave illegally once the war started. This is an aspect that is very little known. I mean, it's all you know is that the Poles unfortunately were quite anti-Semitic, but this part where the Poles helped Jews illegally leave, the Betar helped uh, in uh, gathering together the Jews in Poland and the Irgun, which was also an organization that uh, Jabotinsky began, helped them to get into Palestine. But uh, again, I wanted to mention that book about cafe society in Portugal that really bloomed during World War II. Hmm. 
Thank you, Diane. And how about if we do, we're going to go to Flora for our final question in the session. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, I just want to make a comment uh, regarding uh, the economics, economic systems and the word progress. Um, if we look at uh, our society, which is the most highly capitalist society in the world, uh, Progress, we have, I mean, it, it depends how we define progress. I come from a mindset where, for example, equality is very important for me, very important to me. And when I look at our history in the US alone, if, never mind the whole country, which is predominantly capitalist, um, the, the gap between the rich and poor has big has been become wider and wider. And uh, in addition to other situations, we've had social injustices that we have had in the United States in particular. And so when we, uh, yes, I do believe that when it comes to changes, change towards a better, all this science and technology and all of them are important, but in a context, where these things, these elements are based on profit. I don't think that whole progress, and at least the way I see it, is just, uh, is just an illusion. It's not, uh, I don't think it's gonna happen because basically it's a class system. And a class system, uh, as I was reading in an article recently, uh, they were talking about capitalism in general. There is no way, for example, they said there will be peace in under capitalism because they, they love wars. They, they love to create problems because there's profit in all of these. So it's a profit before people, not the other way around. That's my 25 cents. <laughs> hey, thank you very much, Flora. Um, well, I guess I want to thank you all for attending our session five, uh, Open Society and its Enemies. We still did have, what, concluding remarks, Lance? So I guess I'll turn this over to you. Well, thank you, Corey. I mean, thank you to everyone who participated. Thank you to Corey and to all of our other uh, chairs, to Tom and Susan and Ava. Uh, and thank you all for being a part of this. And I want to just Again, encourage you all, if you're not a member of the Institute of General Semantics, now's a great time to join. You'll receive the entirety of the 2022 volume uh, of et cetera. And we're gonna have a wonderful continuation of our conversations in October at our annual Alfred Korzybski Memorial Lecture and the symposium to follow. Uh, the name of the symposium is going to be Ecologies of Mind, me, uh, Media, and Meaning. And uh, I really encourage you all to come if you can. The call for papers will be uh, made public before too long in, in the very near future. And, uh, and if you can't come, you still uh, can benefit from membership by having access to the exclusive live stream of the event. As I've mentioned, the uh, Korzybski lecture this year will be given by Jan Levin, a Columbia University astrophysicist and novelist. And we'll have more events of this sort, uh, including, and some courses, and we have some really nice new books that'll be released in the coming months as well. Um, and members, get a discount on new and old books. Uh, and I hope, uh, I hope uh, everyone can see how much there is that we can share and uh, learn from each other uh, through this environment. Uh, so again, thank you all. This has been a long, but a very satisfying, exhilarating day. Thank you all for being a part of it. Thank you very thank you. much. Um, Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you, Lance. Good job.